perfect. Well, thank you for uh, the great uh, introduction, and I completely agree uh, on everything you stated. So why don't I start with uh, something easy? I'm just going to uh, transition really quickly and point out the first question I always get, which I'm sure is going to be in there. Um, of course, uh, the uh, recording as well as the slides will be available through Visual SP. If you can't wait, uh, you absolutely cannot wait. That's OK. You can go to SlideShare right now and download the, the all the slides that we'll be going through today and get a feeling for the many, many slides that we're going to be talking uh, about today. So if you're taking notes and you're like, oh, let me write that down, it's OK. The slides will be available. The recording will be available. Um, do not uh, worry about trying to keep up and just try and learn and, and digest as much as you can. Because as, uh, as Asif uh, mentioned, um, I do speak a lot. And I will tell you, my style is very fast. Uh, I get energetic and excited, especially uh, when doing something like a webinar, because uh, it means that uh, we have so many things that we can talk about. So I've jammed a lot of wonderful content into this presentation that we'll be going through. What I want to also highlight is that I am available for questions after today. So um, two other things uh, that often come up is people say, um, hey, uh, if I wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way? Um, Typically through social media, like LinkedIn, uh, is a very effective way to reach out to me. But you can also email me. I didn't put it in here because all the slide decks are always available online uh, and it can cause some spam. But the email address is really easy to remember. It's Richard at tutelead, so Richard, which is my name, at tutelead.com. Uh, if you want to email me directly with additional questions, or maybe you want to set up uh, a 30 minute conversation to kind of walk through what you're dealing with from an adoption perspective, and maybe I can give some coaching and advice because I'd be happy to do that. Today, what we're really going to talk about is what I've seen, uh, especially over the last uh, year. We're going to talk about uh, specific examples as I go through uh, different perceptions and realities. And uh, I'm going to try and share as much as I uh, legally can about the work that we've been doing with customers. Um, so make sure to ask questions as we go through if there's things you want more detailed explanations for. Or, you know, I'd love to have another example of how you do this. Um, so that would be great. With that, let's uh, let's talk about why I want to have the conversation today and why I've structured the, the slide deck the way I have. What, what we find is that a lot of times what uh, we kind of are told isn't always the reality. We all know that adoption is important. Uh, and in most organizations, um, there's a mixture of ideas around how much effort is really necessary for adoption, how much it should cost, and uh, how much we should be doing. And so uh, today, I want to try my best to take some uh, you know, false uh, expectations and misperceptions and clean those up. And at the same time, uh, I want to add a little bit of clarity uh, about you know that while this may seem like a lot of work, um, there's actually very tangible things that we can do that'll make a, a substantial difference in the near term. So we're going to talk about it in three categories. We're going to talk about IT perceptions. Um, this is really for those who are in IT or leading IT or just influencers of IT to say, what is IT responsible for? Then we're going to talk about individual perception. This is applicable for everyone, right? What can we do as one individual, maybe without authority, right? We don't have authority. We're not a leader. We're not necessarily IT, but we really want to have an impact on adoption. What should we do? And then we'll talk the last section, probably the longest, where we'll talk about leadership uh, uh, techniques, uh, uh, basically the stuff that we often do with customers um, around uh, specific actions that they should take and what leaders maybe should do if they want to have an impact in the organization. Now, uh, for, as we flow through these, um, I'm going to go pretty fast. So again, if there's something you want to hear a little bit more detail about, ask in the questions. And when we get to the end of the presentation, we can kind of revisit it and uh, dive a bit deeper. So let's start with the most obvious perception, which is that people will adopt it on their own. We know this is not true. You know, the build it, uh, they will come approach does not work, especially with uh, SharePoint. Uh, for years now, we've seen that. And then when you take a, a solution on SharePoint, like an intranet, or you take a solution like an extranet, team collaboration sites, etc., you run into a very similar pattern. This is also really important because um, in many cases with Office 365, we are changing the way people work. We're encouraging them to work differently. So instead of using Outlook for everything, you know, try and use this tool, try and use that tool. And so again, that change means that um, people need to 
even if it's minor changes, they need to change how they work. And so um, th that kind of change just does not happen uh, effectively. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen effectively on its own. So we want to we want to steer that change. We want to be a part of it. We want to drive that change. And the example here, um, and there's a number of these uh, in the industry, but the example here is that there have been real studies uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole scenario, but there's real studies out there that have basically proven even when it's life or death, we as people don't effectively change. What we need is we need a little bit of direction. We need a little bit of guidance and a little, need a little bit of follow up, right? The coaching almost model. And there are ways to scale that. And we'll talk about that within the organization. But I think the realization here is that IT has to understand at a baseline and whether it's IT or leadership that um, this change does require some level of commitment and engagement from the organization. Um, and we'll talk about IT's commitments in a moment. So the second question that often comes up around that is, well, you know, driving usage, driving, you know, active uh, usage, that's not really IT's problem. IT is responsible for making sure that the technology is available to people, that it's implemented effectively, right? That they're, that it's running uh, and performing really well. And, and that's potentially true in a historic view of IT. But the reality is in today's world, um, it's IT's responsibility to drive adoption as well, right? It's not just the organization's issue. In, in other words, um, successful implementation is necessary, but it's not sufficient on its own. So when you think about getting more people to use the technology at a first level, right? So just getting, uh, it's often called like active usage, getting people to use it in an active state. That is a first step that's kind of foundational. So IT should be measuring and trying to drive active usage. They should be trying to get people to use the technology. And in many cases, some technologies have a really good level of usage, right? Uh, Exchange Online and Outlook, if you're talking about Office 365, tend to be very heavily used by most employees. And when we look at something like that, it may indicate, oh, well, our kind of work is done in that category from an IT perspective. And again, I want to challenge that that's not true. So not only does IT need to drive usage and get people to be aware, um, to, to help with this uh, process, because IT, remember, has implemented these technologies based on the promise of value, right? So you, you've made investments as IT in these technologies to empower the organization, but it's on the promise of value. That value is only realized when people are using the technology. So again, uh, usage as a, as a minimum is important. But then better use is also critical. So take Outlook and Exchange. Think about all those times that you've looked at your own usage of Outlook and learned, hey, there's a button that you just didn't know what it did before. Now you use it all the time. Uh, as an example, when I uh, do a message to a larger group of people, I often use the do not reply all functionality within Outlook to ensure people can't do reply all messages um, as a leader within my organization. And so that kind of functionality is a simple feature that's been around for years in Outlook, but is something that you know, only a few years ago, I learned that I could do it and I've been using it ever since. So there's sort of advanced features in Outlook, especially in SharePoint, um, in Yammer and all these other spaces where there's more that we can do. So it's not just the basic usage consumption or, um, you know, viewing information or maybe in uh, OneDrive uh, case, you know, just using OneDrive, but sharing files and um, doing things like uh, re looking at the reporting and usage on which files are more popular. Again, taking it further than just using the technology, that's IT's responsibility. And it's an important responsibility because if IT doesn't do it, then they're going to lose credibility, trust, and value within the enterprise over time, right? Uh, those organizations that have transitioned to a services-focused IT organization, they've already started to adapt um, to this kind of model. And so ask yourself if you're a IT pro or a dev or something like that, am I, do I understand my impact on driving more effective usage? If it's a developer, you're building great solutions and that's driving people towards it. If you're an IT pro, then you should be figuring out how can I take the reporting and other data and share that more effectively. I want to also touch upon something really quickly here, which is another false perception, which is that, you know, one, we don't want to have a negative impact on people's work. So we don't want to necessarily introduce a lot of these changes um, or we want to defer or delay a change. Now, uh, it is true with any with any new technology, uh, especially in the productivity space, so Office 365, SharePoint, all these things fit within this category, um, you are going to see a dip in productivity. Now that dip is because people are learning how to do things in a different way. Instead of using file shares, now I'm learning how to use SharePoint 
or OneDrive for Business. And so there is a small uh, negative consequence impact here, right? Where I'm just not as fast, I'm not as efficient, I'm not as effective at doing it. But that tends to be a very short period of time. And then I get into, I'm more productive in this environment because unlike the file shares, I can access those from anywhere. Um, it actually gives visibility because when I store my data in OneDrive or SharePoint uh, with Delve, it's discoverable by other people. So there's all sorts of other perks and benefits that are coming along with this simple change. Uh, and the key here is what we can do as IT is we can help manage that change. Now, I'm not saying you need to coach every individual user, but there are things that we can do, um, like providing training opportunities, providing pilots and other things like that to reduce the risk of negative consequences, causing the user to transition back to a legacy or alternative technology. So let me give you an example. If, if I'm training and learning a new technology as a user and I'm doing it during training, that's a place where it's okay to be less productive. Right? It's okay to have an impact on my productivity. And so in that scenario, training is kind of making this a safe area. So it doesn't have the same type of negative potential impact where someone says, oh, this is just too much work. I'm going to switch back to the old model. Because by the end of that training, they're already on this upward curve. That would be one example of a potential goal. Another thing to consider is that we can accelerate this change. So if we um, do things like, uh, and I'll talk about it later, awareness campaigns, and we do uh, other things as IT to help educate and inform the organization, often we can actually accelerate how quickly people get to the positive impact from these changes. And so if we can do that, there's substantial ROI and, and other factors to consider here. Is that a question? Oh, looks like a, just maybe an audio uh, accident there. So um, the other thing to note is I have heard this many times from other IT organizations. Well, we'll just do it at a later time. You know, we don't need to prioritize it now. There's millions of other things that we need to do first. And what I would suggest there is you just want to make sure you understand where your industry is and where your organization is from an IT perspective, especially when it comes to these patterns of productivity and collaboration. And you want a real outside opinion on this often because your internal opinion might be biased. You might think, you know, you have a much stronger competitive advantage when it comes to technology than maybe you do. And so looking at that, if you're far are behind the, the rest of the world, um, you are putting your organization at a competitive disadvantage due to the technology. Your productivity is not going to be as high um, and your the tools that people are going to use uh, when you have a larger and larger gap tend to be alternative or unsanctioned tools. They start to use Dropbox. They start to use these other tools that maybe you never wanted to have within IT, but now you have to support. And now you have even more change management because you're not just transitioning people from legacy or traditional methods to new methods, but you're also transitioning them from you know modern tools to a different modern tool that you'd rather them use for governance and a variety of other IT reasons. So another big one here within IT uh, is this idea of tracking adoption effectively. Now, I mentioned earlier, if you're an IT pro or if you're within IT, um, it's important to understand what data do we have today to report on adoption. And a lot of people think that there's not good data for this. And I would say that this was true, um, especially in uh, SharePoint on-prem. Uh, it's been a challenge. Um, in SharePoint Online, uh, it's, it is not an issue anymore. Um, since the advent of the audit log, as well as um, the different APIs that we can use to, to do much more extensive and advanced reporting, we can even capture events as they're happening. Um, there's just so much more that we can do from a reporting perspective. So in Office 365, um, and I'll, I'll give some examples, this is not an issue. In on-prem, the alternatives uh, that have been in existence for a while now are third-party tools. Uh, and of course, you can actually access things like in SharePoint uh, Server, the databases that have all of the reporting uh, data and you can do all sorts of other stuff with their API as well. So the quick answer here is there are many, many ways to report on usage. Um, so the question here that I often get is, okay, I believe you, Richard, I'll trust you that there are many ways to report on usage and adoption, but what are meaningful metrics and, and how would you do it? So uh, as a really simple example, and I'm only going to give one because uh, we have to move on from this slide, but um, one simple example would be if you've never looked at it, go into Office 365, go into protection.office.com. So that's basically the protection center. And you can actually, uh, uh, I'll avoid the demo to keep the, us on track. But um, 
basically you can actually report on the usage from an audit perspective. So you can see things like for this specific user over this duration of time, what did they share? How often did they share? Um, how, you know, how often did they upload new content? You know, how often did they do it in SharePoint? How often do they do it in OneDrive? So you can do it by location based. You can even pick a site and you could say, I want to know about this site, not just basic usage stats, but really who's been sharing the most in this site, you know, from a, a sharing files perspective, who's been uploading the most and who's been uploading using the sync engine versus non-sync engine. So all that data, that rich data is available to you today in the audit log. Um, and there's ways to distribute it. There's ways to export the data. And like I said, there's uh, third-party tools already that use the APIs that you have access to as well in Office 365 that allow for more advanced reporting. So um, what, I'll, what I'll do maybe as a follow-up here is I'll just point out there are lots of third-party uh, vendors that have this reporting. And, uh, and maybe at the end, I'll list a couple. And uh, we do have a white paper that I promise will come out in the next month before Ignite that will have uh, more details on who the vendors are for this space if you're keen on uh, waiting for that white paper. Another example, uh, you know, around what's happening is it's not just about the fact that we can do it. So let's check that box and say, yes, so IT has a responsibility. If you can do it, IT has a responsibility of helping the organization understand what they need reported and what they don't. I'll give you one more example here, uh, and then I promise I'll move on. This is just obviously an exciting area for me. Um, one thing that another uh, very common request organizations have is we want to know how many people have filled out their profiles in SharePoint or Office 365. So we want to know who's you know filled out the past projects, who's uh, uploaded a picture, who's done X, Y, Z. And so you can actually report on that with PowerShell and other things today. It's again, very easy to do. And so that would be a report that IT should know that they can do. And so naturally um, the question is, why would we do that? Well, because there's a lot of scenarios where the organization will get more value if more people fill out their profiles. So what if we can give data to the organization uh, around maybe a campaign they're doing or some sort of proactive action to help and encourage and foster people uh, to connect with one another and fill out their profiles, which drives everything from workflows to social to um, uh, delve and other experiences. So, you know, even internet people search, right? All those things are powered by that. So lots of reasons that that type of data uh, is an expectation that IT should be able to satisfy. Here's something else to consider. So if you're IT and you're doing everything I've described and you're able, you're basically saying anything you need as a business, we will get you. What kind of reporting do you want? We'll help you out with that. And then obviously you're managing those costs. The other thing to consider is that you want to make it so that the reporting is not just for leaders, not just for site owners, if you think of the SharePoint term, not just for group admins. Um, it should be for people that are uh, in the organization at an individual level that want to get better insight from the data. And you see this with Delve Analytics, but even outside of Delve Analytics, if we look at things like OneDrive analytics uh, for the individual files, when I click on, uh, say, one of the files that I've uploaded, even as an end user today, we can actually see this kind of reporting. And this is really important because it's not just that Microsoft's doing this and it's great and we should be aware of it as IT, but it's actually uh, good because it's saying, hey, as IT, can we do more things like this to empower the organization, give them more visibility? One of the other common things that's been around for a long time is this trending content. It's actually existed in the product for quite some time, but it's been a little bit buried as it you know again shouldering that responsibility can we educate and inform the organization that these kinds of capabilities are in the platform and is there ways that we could visualize them or present them to the users uh, more effectively so that everyone can benefit from understanding you know what the adoption level is in certain categories and we can take shared ownership for this so again um, analytics especially is a really important area for it to take uh, at least some ownership when it comes to the technical enablement and understanding of what is feasible and what's not Another uh, thing that I often see, uh, and I, I was I was struggling with this one. Is this a leadership one or is it IT? I've chosen this to be IT because I find that IT tends to believe in this more often. And I see it as an excuse often. So people say, well, no user should be prioritized over another. So if we do, you know, a training or we do coaching or we help this user, shouldn't we help all the users like that? Um, and so uh, the first thing that I'll note there is that is obviously not true. Um, there's definitely prioritization uh, that you want to do and you want to give a different level of support, engagement, 
uh, and adoption basically support to a certain set of users than everyone else. And those users depend on the solution and what workloads we're rolling out. But as an example, obviously pilot groups, we get more uh, support, um, clear uh, influencers within the organization. So think of executives and other leaders, they should get more support and more coaching and transition management because they have to lead and show by example that they understand the technology and believe in it. And so that kind of rolls often on IT for, for training, enablement, and things like that. But also um, take something as simple as an intranet or a social network. In both those cases, uh, it tends to be a very small collection of people are producing all the content. And so again, those are the people that we really want to um, you know, s focus on in terms of prioritizing the effort around uh, technology enablement, reporting enablement, all the other things that I mentioned, because they're going to get more value out of that than uh, you know an everyday consumer of that information, which might be a larger, uh, typically a much larger percentage of the organization. So, um, so again, everything I've basically said is now we need to target, we need to be responsible for getting the data, and we need to also figure out better ways to use the technology. So earlier I mentioned getting usage at a base level is the first step, getting people to use the technology better is the next step. So this is a, a, an image representation from um, the when to use what white paper for Office 365. And what I just want to draw attention to is this idea that most people use Outlook for everything, but the reality is Outlook is often not the best tool for many, many scenarios, right? So pretty much everything that's listed here, and I'm not being facetious when I say invite a colleague to lunch here, um, this is, uh, Outlook is amazing at scheduling is really what I'm saying here, right? So there's things that Outlook is really good at, but for the most part, there's alternatives, especially in Office 365, that are better solutions. And of course, in your organization, these uh, technologies might include things like Confluence Wiki, or they might include uh, another uh, document management system, or you know, a different social uh, media, or social networking collaboration platform. And so again, you'll have to create your own sort of visualization and model for when to use what. But it's important from an IT perspective to determine when we invest in technology X, why are we investing in it? Right? What is the what is the purpose of this technology investment or that technology investment? And I think that uh, kind of leadership needs to come from IT as well, or at least needs to be supported more effectively today from IT. Um, so that's, uh, again, there's a 60 plus page white paper. It's uh, up to date right now around uh, things like Planner um, that's incorporated into it. And uh, at Ignite in less than a month, I think, uh, we will be presenting a session or I'll be at least leading a session on this. Um, so there will be an update uh, to the white paper before then, and then there'll be a ton of new content that we'll share here if you're interested in it. So when to use what is easy to remember as a when to use what.com, and you can go feel free to look at the white paper there. So that was a whirlwind. Uh, I spent about 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it pretty consistent for the next sections. It's probably going to be shorter. Um, IT, you know, you have a responsibility, right? And that's really what we're getting at. Uh, historically, IT um, didn't have necessarily the same level of responsibility for usage and adoption. That was kind of transitioned to the business. IT is really meant for successful implementation. But that is, as we said earlier, it's necessary but not sufficient. IT needs to take the step forward now, really get into the data and analytics and, and insight and share that with the organization and help drive and steer better decisions um, and empower people to do more or transition themselves to more of a services oriented uh, organization within the enterprise so that they can help people on a more ongoing basis. Um, let's talk about individuals. So this is probably the easiest section. We'll blow through this pretty quick because every one of us has been here, right? I've been uh, a team member on a large enterprise uh, organization where, you know, internally I didn't have a lot of authority and influence and I had to figure out what can I do? What are those little things that I can do that will have an impact? And at the same time, you know, we've worked with people that don't have that same impact and authority. So um, no matter what, these are clear, actionable things that we can all do. So one of the first ones is to understand that we all get affected by adoption. So even if uh, IT doesn't believe in taking ownership for adoption and the leadership might struggle with adoption, we as individuals can own adoption and say, at least around me, I'm going to influence people and try and get them to adopt. Because I know, you know, experiences like Delve, Yammer, um, you know, uh, SharePoint, if you pick 
pretty much any of these experiences, they're much better the more people use them. If you take Delve, that's an obvious thing, right? The more people use OneDrive, the more people use SharePoint, the more people use the file sharing in SharePoint, the more file discovery we get. If you take something like uh, Yammer, obviously the more people that use Yammer, that participate, that consume it, um, the richer and, and more uh, uh, effective the information sharing is, and the more serendipitous value I'm going to get from that uh, social platform. So there's uh, lots of examples like this. Uh, Skype for Business is a great example too. The more people use it, the more you know things like presence become super help helpful and relevant to me. So definitely really important for all of us. So then we often run into this, which is users say, "Well, there's nothing I can do. I get it. You know, I know it's important, but you know, I'm one person. I don't have a lot of influence. So here's some things that you could do. And I'm not saying all of these are great ideas. So something simple you could add into your employee signature, things like yourself on Delve. Things like uh, your Yammer posts, which goes to your Yammer feed, uh, if you're using social uh, platforms like Yammer. If you have a, um, a, just a profile and you're using your Delve profile, you could also kind of just point to that. Lots of th things you can do here where you can add it to your signature. And you can, of course, do different signatures internally and externally. And that can be a great way, because obviously this wouldn't be relevant to external people. Another thing is baited email hooks. Uh, if, you're, if you're sending emails to people, you should include everything in the email, but often uh, it's better for people to go and look at the document and so you might say it's on page 26 of this document here's the link to it send people to the document and have them look that up in context where they're going to get more value and information saves you time and potentially uh, adds uh, impact in terms of them realizing oh it's there's more around this and they could explore the rest of the document and maybe answer a bunch of other questions they haven't asked um, so lots and lots of things there. Um, outside of even that, um, doing things as simple as um, using OneDrive yourself and being consistent, being that exemplary user and figuring out the right ways to share documents. Um, one of the things that I do uh, when I create presentations, every single presentation I create, I make sure I put it in my shared with everyone folder. So you can either create this if you're a new uh, customer to Office 365, uh, or it's been around for many other customers in Office 365 for some time, uh, if you've been in there for uh, before they changed the default behavior. And so here in my OneDrive, I have a shared with everyone folder, and you can see I have all sorts of stuff I share with the organization. So every time I build a, a slide deck or something like that, it's always in there. And that way, in my organization, um, of the 30 people or so that are looking uh, now and then at my Delve profile and other things, they're able to see, oh, I didn't know Richard was talking about adoption coming up. And they actually copy and paste some of the slides and reuse them in internal customer presentations and other things like that. Or it helps me because I go, hmm, let me go start a bunch of decks that I want to eventually do. And it creates conversations internally where someone else is like, hey, I want to do exactly that session. Um, is this all you have? Do you have more material? And again, we, we get that serendipity this conversation. So, so OneDrive usage and using simple techniques like sharing more um, can go a long way. Another obvious one is when you use um, either Outlook 2016 or the Outlook Web Access using the attachment uh, model where it's not, if you, if you basically see um, X kilobytes or X, uh, you know, megabytes, if you see that in an email on an attachment, you, you're doing it wrong, right? That's just, we don't do that anymore, even if you're on-prem. And so what you do instead is you link to the file. So there's multiple ways of linking. You can go get a link on the file itself. You can also do on uh, Outlook 2016 and in Outlook Web Access, you can do an attachment, insert attachment, and actually uh, suggest items from OneDrive or SharePoint, depending on what you've recently been working on. So again, uh, linking to a file, totally what we want to encourage. Uh, anytime you see kilobytes or megabytes in a file or you ask yourself, will this fit in an email? You're doing it wrong. So something to consider there. And that includes for external sharing, because of course we can do get a link and share it with external participants as well. And of course, there's lots of ways to support this from IT. If IT pushes back, um, just have them look at uh, office365extranets.com. Office365extranets.com has a white paper on external sharing, and it basically says that you should enable this and here's how to do it. Um, uh, but we'd be happy to have that conversation with IT as well if you need help. Another one here is uh, the meeting invite comes to you. So I hate meetings when they're mismanaged. And I got to tell you guys, my pet peeve is that most people do not use uh, the Outlook functionality around meetings uh, effectively enough, in my opinion. So what is the first thing that people could do? If someone sends you a meeting invite, remember, this is you, just for you, what you can do is you can say tentative, edit the response before sending. And if it doesn't have an agenda in it, you can say, hey, um, just wanted to know, uh, so I can prioritize this, what are we going to be talking about? Or to make sure I can prep accordingly. And so when you 
you send that edit response with tentative, they'll hopefully will fill out an agenda because they'll be like, oh yeah, I probably should add an agenda for the 10 people that are on this call. Um, and so you can encourage people to improve uh, the way they orchestrate meetings. Now that's basic, that's not really anything magical, but maybe we could take it a step further. What if what we do is um, we message the person who sent the meeting and say, hey, can you uh, add in a link meeting? Because I noticed your meeting has me and you and we're gonna meet on the third floor or whatever, but I'd love to have a, a link meeting set up or Skype for business meeting, I should say, so that basically we can um, record the screens or record the meeting uh, and that way we can have it for posterity or so that if we're both sitting in the same room even, I can see what you're sharing on your desktop and I don't have to crane my neck or we don't have to gather around or we don't have to set up the projector and deal with all that other stuff. So even for like one-on-one -on -one meetings, I'm a big fan of always encouraging us to use things like the video conferencing solution that we bought. Um, another example is uh, if you guys don't, aren't aware, inside of your meetings themselves, you, especially recurring meetings, you can actually add a OneNote to those meetings. And when you add the OneNote to those meetings, uh, it does a couple things. One, for yourself, it's really helpful because you have a consistent set of notes for your meetings. Um, and that way, not only do you have it, but anyone who's invited to the meetings can participate in the notes. Uh, and you can have uh, co-authoring basically inside of OneNote where people are adding comments, ideas, questions, etc. And while not everyone will take advantage of this, even if you do it yourself, it's a really good way of being consistent so you don't have to go, where the heck was that notebook? You can literally just go to the previous meeting, click on the link, and then see those meeting notes. It's also great if you want to send meeting notes after the meeting because you don't have to create a new link. You literally can just copy paste the link from the meeting uh, invite. Um, last thing that's really helpful is it encourages you to create one notes and figure out where they should be stored in OneDrive, in a team site, etc. for these kinds of meetings, which again uses one more uh, element of technology, which is OneDrive and SharePoint um, to help with facilitation of these meetings. And uh, it does some other cool things when you do this. It actually adds in meeting details, uh, a lot of them actually to the one note by default. You can also do things uh, like uh, a big thing that I'm a big fan of is every time I'm having a Skype for Business meeting and there's nothing being shared. So if you have a Skype for Business meeting and it's two talking heads or even for video conferencing, if I have two video feeds, I would always share um, my desktop or always share a notebook and just have that visually on the screen. Why do I do that? Because then as we're talking, I can take some notes. Um, that way, one, I'm making sure I take notes. Two, when they ask things that I'm really confused by what they're saying, I might write question mark on it or I might you know, put for follow up and they'll see that and sometimes they'll correct themselves or as they're uh, kind of describing something because they visually see it, they start to realize, hmm, I need to take a moment and think through what I'm saying because what I'm saying isn't as clear. Um, and so it adds a lot of structure actually if you do visual notes. So basically taking your one note, throwing it up on the screen in every Skype for Business meeting is a really effective trick. And the, the rule for this is if you don't see anything shared, just share it. it can, it'll never hurt. No one will ever be like, oh my God, what are you doing? Why are you sharing that? You can just be like, I'm just sharing my notes. Let's walk through this. And then when you're ready, you can switch to a PowerPoint or whatever else is appropriate. You can even use PowerPoint. So I could even uh, type in my notes here and use that visually. There's lots of other techniques you can use, but big, big fan of that. All right. Another thing that you can do is when someone asks you a question, uh, especially around where's this document, etc. Instead of sending them the document or even a link to the document, sometimes it's better to actually send them a link to a search result page that has that in there. And I know this is a bit more advanced, but you guys are smart, so I believe you can do this. And that way people will start to realize, huh, search is really effective. Look, they were able to find that pretty quickly this way. Or maybe it's your Delve profile and you send them to your Delve profile and say it's the third item or whatever. Whatever, whatever is appropriate, right? Because you'll have to understand whether they have access and other things. But generally speaking, when possible, try and elevate the conversation when you're sharing something instead of just sharing the direct link and share you know, a specific reference uh, as an example instead. And you can be cheeky with it too if you want, but uh, I think generally it's just something that we want to want to do because it'll drive understanding of the power of search um, and that in fact when you store a lot of these things maybe in your shared with everyone folder in OneDrive, uh, again a lot of times what I'll do is I won't send the link, I'll just say it's in my shared with everyone folder under uh, this, this folder or whatever, um, go grab it and here's the link to the shared with everyone folder. So again, little things to encourage people to do more of that exploration on their own so they don't keep coming back to me for those questions. Now, if you're a fan of Morgan Freeman, um, you know how amazing his narration is. Um, so sometimes what I find with social, uh, people say, well, what can I do to improve adoption of social as an individual? And so uh, one of the simplest things you can do is find opportunities to narrate your work. So think of the things that you're doing that are 
worth narrating, for lack of a better term. So I was working with this customer on X. Um, that would be wonderful. There's no downside, right? It's not like uh, there's a risk of exposure here. You're literally just saying, you're not saying what you worked on. You're not saying what the outcomes were. You're just sharing that. So if other people are also working with customer X or are just excited by it, they can reference and comment, etc. And you create potential engagement. Or if I pick a different topic, like I'm actually working on automating X or I'm building this kind of report or whatever it is that I'm doing. And I share that within uh, social. Sometimes people will also comment and go, hey, I'm doing the same thing. Maybe we should connect. And you reduce redundancy because you realize, you know, maybe you and another group and another group are all doing basically the same exercise internally. Or you can do more together than apart. So lots of reasons that narration of your work and providing more visibility to what you're doing uh, can actually have a, a meaningful impact uh, in connecting you to others and giving you more visibility within the organization as well. Um, helping others as an individual, uh, I get, okay, so Richard, we get it. You gave us a bunch of examples of things that we can do as individuals, but is that really going to make a difference with adoption? And the truth is, if you do the, half the things I just mentioned, it will have an impact, right? At least in your group level, perhaps even your um, uh, departmental level, it's going to have a, an impact on the people you work with. And the truth is that people work best um, from a learning perspective and change management, people um, learn best when they work with coworkers. Those are non-managers, non-IT. Now, if you're IT, that's okay. Uh, you should still be doing these things. But generally speaking, non-manager, non-IT people is where people learn best from. And why? Because you know, not everyone wants to go and ask IT, right? It feels it feels bad to have to bother IT again because I feel like a dummy because I don't know how to use technology X Y Z. So that's one reason. And another reason they don't want to go to their managers is again they don't they don't want to uh, be vulnerable, right? They don't want to say, well, I don't know this or I I I want to improve on this. Um, and so either the culture needs to fit that where it encourages that and then some people will take part and the non-manager non-IT becomes less relevant or you have to recognize in your organization that the best way for people to learn is still going to be coworker. So then your point here is the more and more you influence the people around you that here's better ways of working and here's how I'm adopting and embracing this technology um, and you become that exemplary person, the more they'll probably reach out to you or reach out to those who you've helped who again have learned from you. So even as an individual, you can have this sort of staggered effect uh, over time across the broader organization just by the impact you're having on coworkers. So uh, extremely effective. Um, I, I wish I could show you that real data points. We've had customers where we did this. Uh, we call them experiments with a few uh, resources to really enable them and see what impact they have, kind of a cascading impact. And it's actually pretty amazing after a few months when, you, when you're watching usage of, say, a group or department and you've enabled one person really strong and they really believe in it, um, you start to see them influencing all those around them. And you see the active usage and other usage metrics spike. And you see things like the number of shares etc increasing so it, it definitely does work um, and there's ways uh, as an individual that you can you know validate that the effort that you spent was worthwhile all right so that was a really fast run through of IT perceptions uh, and reality and individual perceptions versus reality now for the hard one which is leadership perception um, and this is really uh, it could also be framed as organizational perception um, how do we do this stuff so the first thing that I hear all the time is, well, it's up to users, right? We believe in a grassroots approach, and we think that if we, it goes back to the, almost the same thing IT was saying, if we just give them the technology, we give them the capability, it's up to them to better their situation. And uh, we've already mentioned that this is not the right approach, but let's, let's uh, for the sake of context here, let's talk about what does it mean from a, a leadership perspective. So leaders can make a decision on whether or not to use something. Now, IT sometimes is a leader in this, and they can say, we're no longer going to use these, this file share. It's going to be set to read only. And that way, hey, now we're going to use OneDrive or SharePoint. Um, but there's a, an action at some point that needs to be taken uh, where it's, let's stop using this. Let's remove this alternative as an option. Let's be really clear from a leadership perspective that we do not encourage, recommend, or support uh, this tool. This is an unsanctioned tool and an unsanctioned usage. And if you do it, um, you know, you are not uh, doing things best practice wise or the way we'd like you to. And here's why, right? And of course, there's the other piece to this, which is um, driving leadership from an exemplary perspective and other things. But mandating usage and removing alternatives is absolutely something that leadership can do. And so 
sometimes you have to make that step, right? You just have to take that step. Another thing leadership can do that IT or an individual often can't on their own is incorporate it into things like new hire orientations or annual training or skills validation. So finding ways to take um, technology, uh, you know, awareness, um, understanding, uh, to take that technology skill and just help people improve it um, and track their improvement, that's really relevant. Uh, you know, making sure that people have the basic understanding, not just of here's the internet site in the new hire orientation, go use this, but actually saying, hey, when you use the internet site, there's also this Yammer groups and this and that. And by the way, um, here's a pre-recorded uh, training session we highly recommend you watch. And then what we'd like to do is have you answer a couple of key questions about, you know, when to use what technology, you know, when should I use Outlook versus this, etc. in our organization, what we would encourage you to use, right? Now, again, does it mean that the every new hire is going to start using all those tools? No, because they still have to change their behavior, but at least it's setting the right precedent uh, in the beginning of the process, or it's setting the right precedent on a uh, fiscal or, or the appropriate scheduling cycle that, hey, this is a priority for our organization, right? Technology enablement uh, and being effective employees uh, in this modern world, in this digital workplace, that's important to us. And here's the kinds of investments we're making it from a leadership perspective. Another question that I get, uh, and this is a perception that's often very confusing, is people say, well, we really want to identify champions, or we really want to have more champions, but it's really hard to find them in the first place. Um, or, you know, we want to do a champion program, but our culture, our people, we just don't have the kind of people that would make sense for that. We don't have the budget for it, those types of things. So champion programs are... Um, the most cost-effective way to improve adoption. There's no question about it uh, because you're basically getting free support from the organization in return for really, really, really basic enablement. Uh, you're basically helping them with escalation. You're giving them maybe some uh, train-the-trainer type material and other things like that and self-service. And, and that's really uh, the champion program's sort of basic foundational level. So when you're trying to identify champions, if that's the concern, there are many, many ways to do that. You could look at, like I mentioned earlier, IT has the Ability to do a lot of analysis of usage and analysis on um, how people are using the technology so that can help you identify who maybe the better uh, or more active users are and those could be potentially good champions um, you could also do things like um, there used to be this technique it's not as true today um, but at one point uh, in organizations when um, the only browser that was out of the box or the one that was enabled by default was the Internet Explorer experience. Those who installed Firefox or Chrome or Safari, etc., um, they actually were a good indicator of someone who's taken extra effort to improve their personal productivity at the workplace, right? So they've, they've gone over and above. Now, I'm not saying that one of those browsers is better. I'm just saying that they've shown clear evidence that they've taken action to try and improve their experience, which suggests that they're willing to either experiment or understand other tools that could help them be better from a productivity perspective. So sometimes looking at those who have installed these types of uh, browsers historically has been a technique we've used. In a modern day world, we look at apps uh, a lot of times. So if you have managed devices, what apps have they installed? Who's installed like some of the Office apps? Who's installed you know, OneDrive app, etc.? And those people tend to be people that may have taken a little bit more than just just the basics uh, and they're trying to understand how to improve that experience and so again enabling those people might be a good way of doing it you can of course find these people through surveys and polls uh, interviews you can look at for polls those who've responded uh, to, you know literally to questions like would you like to be a champion to those who've answered that they feel like they're an expert at certain things uh, and sort of self-selection bias is applied there but it can be an effective way of potentially finding new candidates um, and that brings me to the last point, which is champion programs uh, are programs. They run over a period of time, and it's important for those to actually have cycling of champions. So some people who have been a champion for a long time shouldn't be, uh, at least shouldn't, be a champion without extra steps being taken, right? Either recertification or, or something else. So doing a champion program where you say you are a 2017 champion, a fiscal champion, or um, a quarterly champion or whatever, and doing that type of model can help because it helps identify and it makes it that much easier when you say you're still a champion, you're a former champion, or you're a champion to us, but we're not gonna prioritize the same level of engagement and involvement with you. I know that's really sticky for some organizations. It's a hard subject, but it's important because you wanna bring in new champions 
your champion uh, group should continue to grow over time, not stay the same for months and months or at least quarters and quarters. And the second thing you, you do want to do is you do want to encourage a little bit of that because there is an expectation, right? If champions are expected to do certain things, there's a reasonable expectation that at some point uh, sooner or later that people might not want to be champions anymore. And that's okay, right? They're still get all the praise as being a champion in the past, etc. They're a former champion, however you want to do it. But you do want to get those people out so that you can not overwhelm them or annoy them with all the champion communication that's targeted to them versus say the broader organization. Um, okay, so that's that. Another one that we often hear is, well, we're leaders and we get feedback from users all sorts of the times. So we do polls, we do surveys, and we collect feedback. Um, but the question here is, do you actually take action on the feedback and do you share what action was taken? Not just share the results, because a lot of people are pretty good at sharing results of feedback, but they don't necessarily share you know, the process that went into making the feedback decisions or what feedback wasn't acted on and why, right, um, is another good example. And you can do this at the individual level or more importantly, you can do it at an organizational or a group or departmental level where you share broader and you say, look, here's what we learned and here's why we took this action or we didn't take this action. Um, so people feel like the feedback cycle is self-fulfilling, that there's value in me sharing my feedback, etc. So again, uh, take feedback and make it really focus on what comes out of it because feedback just for the sake of saying, hey, we got feedback is pretty much irrelevant, right? You really want to have clear action. All right. I'm going to pause for a moment because we're about to get into probably the deepest section, which is let's assume uh, your leadership team is already doing everything we've talked about. They've got a champion program. They've got uh, they're, they've accepted and acknowledged that they need to be actively involved. They've removed alternatives. They're helping IT. IT and the leadership team is working together. And so uh, we're even taking action on feedback and we're actively soliciting and looking for feedback. So now, um, you know, what else can we do? Because we're already doing more than most people. We're already doing a ton, you know, Richard, what, what in, a real, in a real world, what are the things that we should do? And so I could say stuff like this, but this is, again, that perception versus reality trick, right? A lot of people say, well, you know, pick a, pick a subject, let's pick your internet. You could do usability testing, card sorting, improve your taxonomy, your navigation. You could improve your information architecture. We can do diary studies, understand how people are using the technology today and give suggestions for how they can improve it. We can do uh, different games and other exercises and so on and so forth. And there's, there, I'm not saying that these aren't valuable, but these these tend to be um, things that organizations go. I really want to do these things, but it's just it's it's either too much or we need to have a clear project uh, that's driven off of this. So we hear this, and so instead of giving this kind of guidance, we've gotten a little bit more particular. So here's what we found: we found that most organizations. Um, when they look at successful adoption, there's basically six areas that they invest into. I've talked about champions and a champion program, um, and I've talked at least from a high level around support uh, thus far, but guidance and policies and things like that are also really important. Um, and I'll talk about the right-hand side in a little bit. So let's talk about the left-hand side. Um, let's specifically uh, zero in on this. And what does this turn into, right? What are the artifacts? What are the tangible things that are created from focusing on these investment areas? And typically what you find is it's, um, and I'm going to simplify, it's, it's programs, it's policies, and it's guidance. So if we look at something as simple as roles and responsibilities, if I was to take something like the roles uh, that you traditionally uh, should have within Office 365, Five, right? So we should have champions, we should have departmental leads, we should have an HR manager that's engaged and involved because there's a whole lot of reasons that this impacts HR. We should have communication involved, we should have um, executive sponsors, business owners, and there's some other stuff here that you can't see um, around uh, SharePoint leads, etc. You should have all of these roles. And when you have these roles, we need to check a couple things, right? Do you have named people in those roles, named individuals that are responsible for those roles? Do they understand that they're responsible for these things? Do they know what common activities uh, and expectations they should have for that role? Um, do you have things like effective resources supporting that role or that role producing resources for the broader organization? An example of a resource um, that's specific for HR is understanding uh, the 
HR processes and the HR plan and how that maps to technologies like Office 365 and how that's going to connect. Or if you pick a champion one, we talked about resources already, program guides and things like that, um, things to help people understand the expectations set for champions, uh, things to help people just know who the champions are within the organization. Those are all resources. Um, if you look at beyond resources and we talk about communication, right, do we have effective communication from these roles? And there's all sorts of questions we can ask here, right, um, uh, from business owners. Are they effectively communicating the value proposition? Do we have a clear value proposition for Office 365 or specific workloads within it, like intranets, extranets, et cetera? If we look at coordination, do we have, you know, effective coordination? Are all the people identified and are they meeting regularly is really the simplest uh, way of explaining coordination. And then engagement is even more critical. You know, are they being an exemplary person? Are they active in uh, Yammer? Are they active in some other uh, area where they're basically sharing what they're learning and what they're up to and the status of projects and the status of all these other things that are relevant to Office 365. So this is an area that every organization can invest in. And um, if, if you need help, um, uh, again, I do hope to have this before Ignite, but just in case um, there's questionnaires, you can always just email me and I can send you a sample of a questionnaire of the types of questions we'd ask to help grade some of these basic things and help identify where they should prioritize. Um, so a lot of organizations might not have a community manager or any community leadership type role uh, within their organization because maybe Yammer hasn't historically been as supported or prioritized. And maybe that's a great opportunity for the organization to kind of embrace. And so there's lots of examples like this that we could go through. So that's roles, responsibilities, readiness. There's also this idea of policies and guidance. I mentioned on the left-hand side of those investment areas, there's other things that we want to invest in. So, you know, that I've talked about champions like crazy, so we might as well use those, right? Do you have a champion coverage and selection plan? Basically something that says, these are our champions. This is the business units they're in. This is the geographies that they represent. And uh, these are the gaps, right? These are the geographies we don't have representation. These are the business units we don't have representation. These are the um, uh, types of employees. So long, long-term employees versus you know new employees, et cetera, that are not or are in the, the champion programs, et cetera. So all of this is, is something that you should have to greater detail. If we look a little bit long, later here, we have things like commitment guides. Well, obviously, you know, they should commit to certain things if they're going to be a champion. And at the same time, we should commit to them that they're going to get advantages, right? So not only are we saying, here's our expectations, but we're also saying, by the way, you're going to get higher level of uh, escalation and support. We're going to have proactive champion only training that you can sign up for. We're going to have things like that where it's a little bit more interactive than the broader training we might do for the organization, etc. So lots of things you can give them, but uh, you guys get the idea. Policies and guidance. There's literally, I could name off about 30 different policies and guidance documents or deliverables or subsets of a governance document, etc. that you should probably have uh, that probably should live in a center of excellence. Do you have a center of excellence for things like collaboration, productivity, Office 365, SharePoint, you name it. Um, and then that becomes also very relevant. So I know that's a lot. Um, this is probably one of the first areas where people go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a lot of stuff I want to hear more. So the gist here is just to remember, it's all about um, investment. I'm not saying you need to follow exactly what I'm saying here and you know track every role and responsibility that could be overkill, but figure out what makes sense for you to prioritize. Where is your biggest gap today? Is it champions? Is it guidance? Is it policies? Is it um, you know basic frameworks uh, for things like support and escalation uh, uh, management and stuff like that? Then focus on those things first. All right. So the second thing to talk about here before I get into campaigns is this idea that everyone approaches adoption differently. So I get this all the time uh, and we know this is true. Uh, people do approach adoption slightly differently because uh, we have now probably done, even in the last three months, we've probably done like 12 different uh, adoption campaigns and projects with companies helping them out with everything I was just describing. And of those, I would say only two were pretty similar. Everyone else, they had a slightly different approach. They had different priorities. They had different technologies at play, right? They have other enterprise investments. All these other things can have a difference. So I'm not saying that adoption needs to be uh, consistent at a tactical level, but at a strategic level, adoption is really consistent. Um, and if we look at something like what Microsoft has provided at success.office.com or fastrock.microsoft.com slash office, they actually have uh, taken a, a fairly good look at what are those key things that you should consider, right? What are your business vision uh, scenarios and objectives? Which ones map to you? Um, do you have an adoption plan in place? Do you have resources committed? And are you executing the adoption plan typically over months? And uh, are you measuring and sharing success and iterating on that? So these, you know, if we were at a high level, it, these are all true. 
Now the problem I have is that many organizations um, they say okay we get it so adoption is manageable it's consistent uh, at least from a high level strategic perspective so let's start you know dealing with adoption in this way and the biggest thing to note here that I, and this is this is preference uh, this is based on my opinion as a professional in this field who's done many 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 adoption engagements with my team I will tell you the vision and, and scenarios that is really important but most customers uh, either don't have the budget they don't have the authority or it's just really challenging or they already have these and we just have to map to them so this is important but i would stress and prioritize the adoption plan and the commitment to the plan as being the most important and i found that unfortunately when people start to create these adoption plans they do it at such a high level that it's not actionable, it's not tactical. And so when you're committing to something, you're committing to these broader ideas versus actually committing to, I'm gonna do this, this, and this, this month. So what I wanna do is I wanna take a step back and say, start here, start with success.office.com. I, I implore you, go take a look at all the free resources Microsoft provides, but then go further. And so going further, um, let me explain why this is really important. We all want everyone to adopt things as fast as possible. And the truth is, when we think of coordination investment, there's some users that will actually adopt pretty much uh, faster than anyone else. And all we have to do for them is share that, hey, this is an opportunity, like that this exists, right? That, that we actually have this capability, this new technology, or that they have access to something. Um, so these users are the easiest by far. And these are the users where you still need to take proactive action, but the action is very basic. It's, did you know tips? It's pre-launch communication for a workload. It's saying things like, hey, um, we, you probably would do this on your own, but here's a great thing. Just be aware that this is coming out at this date and that there's these supportive resources for you, self-service resources, et cetera. So that's what this group is all about. The second group of adopters tends to be the adopters that say, we need support, we need something, we need guidance, we need prescriptive, tell me what I should be doing. Like, okay, I get that I can improve collaboration, but what should I do? Tell me something specific I should do tomorrow that will help me improve collaboration. So this is where help, coaching, how-to tips, in-context training, uh, you know, training programs, uh, training uh, sessions scheduled where people can um, sign up for those, all these things, uh, contests, all of these things fit in this category. And these are really, really critical. This is normally the first place that organizations fail because they don't effectively map out in their adoption plan, not just the did you know and awareness stuff, but this stuff, which is really about understanding, this stuff that's about helping them with how to's and advice and, and creating a funnel effect, right? Because if you think about it, if you create things like help coaching, how to uh, schedule training, uh, contests, and we have a contest award winners, contest award winners goes back down to this category and everyone gets awareness, but now we've created a funnel effect where, um, again, people who do need this or who want to improve even more as early adopters can now kind of uh, accelerate their adoption and accelerate their usage uh, of these technologies and effective usage of the technologies. The last group um, that we often talk about is those who need to understand the value. And you can't get to this group, to be clear, you cannot get to this group without first going through these other two. And what I mean by that is from a, a focus perspective, just focusing on this group is a bad idea from the get-go because it tends to be the most expensive in terms of effort. Um, however, if you do these other things, this is basically almost free value add because if you're doing this coaching, you're doing the trainings, you're doing contests, and you're doing a lot of this awareness stuff, you'll find that there are people who have stories. You'll find that there are people who've won contests. You'll find that there are people who say, this is how the technology's impacted me. And so you just need to capture those and spend a little bit of time sharing those and going through the cycle again. So imagine uh, instead of the traditional model of adoption, think of it as a funnel. And all you're trying to do is get people involved in adoption, which is, tends to be a lot of this communication stuff that we're doing. And then once they're in that funnel, we wanna mature them as quickly as we can to the point that they understand the value, that they uh, are supporting other users because they know all the resources, even if they're not, if they're not even coaching users on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they at least know the resources that are available and lastly they've already adopted it so that's kind of where we want to get to so if I was to summarize all, all of that and by the way there's some people that will never adopt until this all happens so we want to focus on these groups and the way we do this uh, in simple terms is we create campaigns and a campaign is a little bit different
different than an adoption plan. An adoption plan is in effect uh, same idea, right? We have scheduled tasks, etc. But a campaign, in my opinion, is a little bit more detailed. It has the activities, it has training, it has measurement. Because a campaign, unlike an adoption plan, even has specific time periods that we're rolling a campaign out, typically over 30 days, 35, uh, maybe 25 business active business days, right? Things like that, so that there is more time for that funnel to have its full impact, for more time for people to register for training, to roll out, maybe the, do repeat the training as an example, for us to measure, uh, because after a period of that long, typically at least the first people that started to engage in, in the campaign, we can actually see how much more they're using Office 365 than before the campaign started. And then we can even see after effects, three months after the campaign was completed, if the campaign was focused on one subject, like driving uh, increased sharing and collaboration in the organization, are we seeing continued uh, increases in sharing and collaboration even after we've done the campaign because of the champion programs, because of this other stuff? So again, having a, a period of time like this where we're looking at it and saying, for this period of time, we're going to run the campaign uh, makes it a lot more actionable. And as you can imagine, uh, unlike the high level adoption plans that you might have considered before, if you've looked at success.office.com, what I'm saying is you need to make these much more detailed. So you don't just say we're doing an adoption campaign, something like collaboration matters or uh, recognition matters or improving um, you know organizational X um, the reason you do the campaign uh, uh, with more detail is you want to say what are we actually going to do during this time period so we know we want to do a campaign around driving recognition because we believe that our employees are matter and they're important and if we do a campaign around recognition we know that people will use things like Yammer which has praise or delve praise or whatever it is that you're using to recognize people. And that'll increase usage in those things. It'll increase connectivity between employees. It'll uh, provide visibility to projects and success stories within the organization that we can use to drive value discussions uh, and improvements um, and so on and so forth. All of the things I just described only uh, tertiarily relate to technology, right? It's a, it's a benefit that lots of leaders and people in the organization are going to want to get behind. Of course, I want to support improve, improving collaboration or improving employee recognition. And so you pick the campaign title that fits the broader goal, and then you align it with very specific tactical things that the technology obviously has a play in. So let me give you some examples. If we dig into tips, um, what you do is you maybe create a series of tips. Um, let's say we do a 25 day campaign. We do a tip per day. And each of the tips basically has, we'll pre-build the tips. We'll give them the text you can see on the right hand side an example of one so we'll give them the text maybe even an imagery and say this is what you need to do and it'll be copy paste exercise for some leader in the organization so what we want is immediately if we have 25 tips we could have 25 distinct people in the organization helping drive this campaign they don't need to build the campaign they don't even need to build the tips they literally can just consume what we're giving them and then on the appropriate day publish so all you're managing is a schedule and uh, all you're managing is how do we want the weeks to be themed because of course each of these people that are sharing tips you have to think about again take it further how are they actually going to do this so maybe we have a center of excellence site a knowledge hub think, think of something like that and they're going to communicate these tips on that knowledge hub daily and then once a week we'll do one post on the intranet or at a organizational level that says here's you know discovering information at uh, xyz at to lead here's what we've learned and here's the five tips and by the way here's the challenges um, that you should do and if you do these challenges what's more is um, when you do them and you post about them in yammer using this topic or hashtag you have a chance to win etc and here's the winners from last week so what you're doing is you're sending one either email message or a uh, internet post or whatever it is once per week and then you're doing all these other ones throughout the week and what this does is it creates a funnel effect right because in week two or three a person who finally hears about it or says I'm gonna take a, a glance at this goes wow they've been doing this for a while there's all sorts of stuff for me to read and understand and they start to get pulled into that funnel process and they start to see things like oh there's training coming up uh, on week three uh, that I can take part in great I'm gonna sign up for that training and again we can increase the registration for training uh, and we can make sure that we follow up with those who were trained and target better uh, guidance and follow-ups and coaching and things like that 
So tips, uh, well, may, while they may seem really simple, they're really important not just to note, hey, we're going to do a bunch of tips, but to really do the pre-work of saying, what are those tips going to be and define them for the entirety of the campaign. And this is doable if your campaign is only 25 days, that's 25 tips, or it could be, you know, uh, 10 tips across 25 days. I'm not saying you have to have a tip per day, right? So you define that, but definitely think of it at that kind of tactical level and think of who's going to communicate this tip, right? Don't have it all come from one or two leaders, have it come from different people every day and there's no downside to that right now we get more people involved we get more visibility in a variety of places let me give you another example um, those challenges that I mentioned these are really important because remember there's a group of people that just want to know what should I do different I mentioned earlier this idea of, hey, you can add one note to a recurring meeting. That is a specific thing that they could do. You're saying there's a tip, which is, you know, one note's awesome, here's how it works, et cetera. But the reality is that the big thing here that you're trying to push is just do this one thing. And if you do this, you'll automatically start to use OneDrive, uh, maybe for where the storage for the meeting notes are, or at least a SharePoint team site where appropriate. And you'll now be uh, effectively taking better notes during meetings and more people will be able to take part and so on and so forth. So we're improving the way meetings meetings are managed or, or meetings in general in that one way. And then there's tons of other ways. You can see a bunch of examples here. So again, the slides will be available to you. So there's lots of ways that we can challenge people. Theme it. Uh, I will tell you, we've uh, found that if you're doing lots of tips, you definitely want to theme them and coordinate them. You don't want to just have random tips because it'll feel disjointed. Um, but if you do that effectively, it'll actually translate really well into the training, uh, which we'll get into. Um, contests also work really well. Um, when paired with this stuff. I hate the idea of contests on their own because they're expensive. And so if a contest is part of something like this, then it just increases the the number of people that come into the funnel. And it actually, again, drives people towards things like training or going to the next steps, especially if your contest mimics the things like the week's theme or it mimics multiple week's themes. Uh, or it mimics the entirety of the, the initiative. So if we have a thing about driving collaboration or we have a, a campaign around recognition, we can have contests that revolve around those same ideas. Um, so you could use data. Uh, remember, IT has a whole lot of data they could use where they could pick random uh, winners. You could do things like a quiz and have people fill that out. I can provide samples of quizzes and stuff if you guys want to email me after so that other customers have done. You can do a uh, collaboration matters co type contest, the one I gave earlier, where people basically say, okay, here's the challenge. I took the challenge here's my post about what I did when I did it picture whatever and then you randomly select uh, a winner each week or however you want to do it um, and then there's an example even on the right there's lots and lots of these contests uh, sorry it won't fit I do hope to share a lot of this in the coming uh, weeks before ignite but if I don't um, at least you have something to start with here which is again you're not just saying there's a contest you're really defining what it is how you're measuring it what's the impact and the awards don't need to be money they don't need to be you know gadgets they can just be um, lunch with an executive. Um, so there's lots of ways to do this in a cost-effective manner. Training, I think, is pretty straightforward. So the only thing I'm going to call out on training is obviously you should plan it. Remember that there's a lot of value in doing this training when it's in a coordinated setup like this because you have registration that's starting here. And then for the second time you roll out that same training, let's say you have all this time where people who went to the first one might go to the second one, or you can have other people who are like, oh, I'm really interested in that, and they do that. Or you can even look at the training and say, hmm, that wasn't enough time, or there was more questions. Let's do advanced training for these same people that took part in the training and those who expressed interest registered earlier for this one and we'll repeat it here and if on this one we get the same kind of response we've already built the material and we'll repeat it on this week and so again you're just you're just planning training you're scheduling it you're creating registration links etc on the same pattern you want to make sure that training is interactive um, we do a lot of remote training so you can imagine when you do remote training with people and this is important because today things like office 365 are meant to be used across the world so if you have global organizations people all over they're using training the reason we do interactive uh, exercises is because it makes sure that they actually use the technology it makes sure that they actually put it to use so even something as simple as saying do this exercise um, upload a document to this library with your name in it, we can track that in the actual training. I can literally have that library open on the screen and I can say, look, Judy uploaded it, Sam uploaded it, it looks like you guys are doing great. Um, I haven't seen one from Jim, you know, could you upload it? And when you have one to few or even one to many training, there are effective ways to do that. And then when people have issues, you can always follow up afterwards to give them more um, support, coaching, et cetera, as needed. So training shouldn't be 
talking like I'm doing right now. It should be exercise driven, even remote, and there is ways to do it. Training should be in context, uh, or help at least should be in context. And so, you know, <laughs> Visual SP, right? Amazing product. So you can have in context help here where you can quickly see, hey, this is how to do this. Here's how to do that. Um, how does versioning work? Answering key questions. Um, and you can make this part of your general training and all the other things. The so tips, right? One of your tips could be about how you can use these things to learn more about it, um, which is built into Visual SP. So lots of third party options to also improve this. Um, last point, communication, it's easy one. Make sure you have a communication plan. Don't just break down each email, each uh, group posting, each intranet post, et cetera, that you're gonna do during the course of the campaign, but actually take the time to pre-build the material for it. So here's an example of what I might communicate to a tip team member saying that your tip's coming up and I want you to communicate this tip, you copy paste this. If you're new to it, here's how you do it, et cetera. So you can see here, I've got very clear instructions. And now as soon as the campaign starts, I literally am just basically sending out schedules emails that I've probably already pre-written. In many cases, you've done all the pre-work before, and we're only talking about maybe a week of effort uh, for most employees, uh, for, for most leaders. It only takes like one, I need one person full-time for a week, and we can basically build an entire campaign. That's, that's in essence what you could do. Now, it takes multiple weeks because you want approval and there's people that want to be involved, but generally speaking, it's a very little amount of effort or investment to get to here. Um, and of course we measure. Uh, I don't have an effective way of showing measurement because of course it's all uh, NDA and specific to customers, but I will tell you that because it's campaign based, it's much easier to report. So you just need to say, how are we gonna report on success and efficacy? And uh, if you need some ideas around, you know, what's the value proposition, et cetera, there's lots of kind of pre-built guidance. This is gonna be one of the white papers that I hope to publish in the next little bit, probably a week or two out, um, you guys should see ROI type uh, business impact white paper. All right, so that was a lot. Um, and I knew that we would digress there, but um, it's really important to understand these two real world uh, options of how to address these. So if we go back through this, we said IT perceptions versus reality. You know, the first one was IT has an important responsibility, own it and start to take proactive action. Individual perception, it matters and we can do something. I gave lots of examples of what we can do. A leadership perception, it's all about policies, guidance, campaigns. I really love those campaigns. They're easy to grasp and understand um, and they go a long way. <laughs> With that, um, I will switch to Q&A mode uh, for the remaining time. Thank you everyone who's attended. Um, the slide deck again is up available right now at this link. Um, the white papers that I mentioned uh, in throughout the presentation are also available there as links. Phew. <laughs> So uh, questions so far from, from the audience. Um, I'm just gonna pull up in my little window here and ask if, if there's any ones that you can think of that are really good, feel free to verbalize them and all. There was definitely a lot of good ones. I just wanna start at the top actually. So um, best practices for on-prem, yes. And uh, so they're on-prem for a long time. So this is something that we hear a lot, right? Um, I'm an organization, I love this stuff, Richard, it's great, but we, we're gonna have a hybrid situation for a period of time, a, a long period of time, or we might just always have some workloads on-prem. In that type of uh, scenario, the campaign, the models that I've described, those are still true. What's added as complexity is that there's going to be um, technology friction, right, in the short term. There is a real impact when you have an on-prem SharePoint environment and you're using OneDrive, right? Yes, the links are there, but if you have 2010 or 2007 on-prem SharePoint, you know, you're going to want to modernize that. Otherwise, you, the integration options are more limited. So, so there's a number of uh, factors that could impact um, which workloads you prioritize, which things you're trying to drive adoption for, and that do complicate this, but it doesn't really change the exercises. It doesn't really change the types of activities you're doing. It just changes the scale of them, right? Instead of doing everything or a broader collection, you're just prioritizing a few focused things. Um, and you wanna probably involve other alternative uh, on-prem investments as well. Um, I promise I will add more because the Microsoft team specifically asked for this inside of the Ignite presentation for when to use what. So. I will share more at that point, but that might be a good starter. Um, is auditing turned on by default? It is not. You need to go turn it on at the Office 365 tenant level. Uh, Um, are there ways to automatically suggest a tool to a user based on their activity level? Um, there are, 
the automated is the hard term here. So first you want to start with, are there ways? Yes, um, because you just need the data and then you can drive it. But uh, if you wanted to automatically suggest, say, to a user they should use more of X or Y, the way you want to do that is you want to do it at bulk level. So you're basically looking at really basic statistics saying these users have not touched or used OneDrive, let's say, or something like that. You've assessed that this department or this group broadly doesn't have any restrictions or an alternative technology that they've already invested into. And you're saying, okay, now you should go use this. And you do like a mini campaign per that group. Um, you don't have to do the same campaign depth that I was describing, but you're basically putting together a communication plan. You're putting together, um, you know, some maybe training specifically for that group to help them with change management. And then you're targeting them. So automated is probably not something we we would do we have done uh, with one customer we did a, like a little quest engine I don't know how else to describe it think of a exercise where the user goes to a page on the internet or something like that and it's all about improvement and so they see their 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 page and it says here's 10 things that we think you could do this week it actually says things like we use the the graph API and we report on things like you've um, collaborated on 10 documents this week, uh, you know, your target is 15. Do you want to change your target? And then they can create their own targets for those types of activities. So you're, you're basically using the out of the box uh, data and creating these simple little uh, widgets or web parts or components or client side parts, etc. that basically have um, these uh, reporting. So there are ways to, I'm not saying there's not cool development things you can do because we have done those with customers, but it, it tends to be, uh, you, what you don't want to do is just automate it completely. Those are supportive with a broader campaign or supportive with other initiatives uh, as well. Um, there was a, another question here around getting a link in SharePoint 2016. Uh, so sharing limitations. Um, so, you know, getting a link uh, is different. You're right. Uh, and even like older versions of SharePoint, but you could still give them the instructions to do that. And you could make it easier too with third-party tools. There's third-party tools that allow you to explore libraries and other things within the Outlook experience um, that some of them are even free um, that actually encourage people to use links instead of attachments. So sometimes, especially if you're an on-prem scenario and um, some of the features that we're describing aren't in a feature pack yet for 2016, um, your best option might be third-party or just teaching them what's there now and and uh, and making sure that you prioritize it when that uh, feature becomes available. Um, there's another question here. I like this question. Uh, Susan Powell asked, is there anywhere we can go to see a role-playing or story-like example of how this technology is used in a real-life uh, setting, day in the life, etc.? There are many community examples of this. Um, in the when to use what, we kind of went through some scenarios, but it was more uh, organizational guidance like train the trainer so training you guys on how to communicate that the best way to get these stories is to actually um, just literally do a diary study or do a study with a user in the organization find a champion and say write down uh, you know how you use the technology in an average day the reason I suggest doing that is because it'll it'll resonate better you can tweak it obviously what they share you can combine and, and improve and put some visuals in there or whatever um, so it resonates with more people in the organization but generally speaking it's better to have them because then they own it they support it and they'll evangelize it versus you saying oh this is the way you know you guys should work and then people saying well that's not how I work that's BS like you're out of touch so you really want to make sure that you've driven it from the organization uh, you can use the community driven stories as inspiration but again I wouldn't uh, we've had many customers who ask us to basically say well you've done this with other customers can't we just use their stories and I'm very cautious on that because of that sense of ownership and because sometimes people immediately go they get turned off because they're like well this isn't our organization right so um, you just have to make sure it's really tailored personas and other things can help with that as well um, samples for policies and guidance documents I do have some of those uh, Igor I have those today on ourharbridge.com they're really out of date I'm so sorry I think they're like from 2010 um, I promise we have made lots of new ones. I, I just have to prioritize publishing it. So just email me, ping me, uh, Twitter me, and keep saying, hey, Richard, what about those samples? Provide more samples. Uh, and it'll. I feel really guilty if I don't respond to those things. So I'm sure it'll encourage me to move faster on those. Um, and it looks like, I think that's all the questions. Oh, uh, will the white paper include the tips, campaigns, et cetera? Um, I'm trying to figure out the right way of doing this. Uh, the white paper will probably be simpler in terms of just guidance, because I'm realizing 70 plus page white papers are intense for people. Um, if you guys want it, let me know. 
but uh, I'm probably going to do uh, my target right now. I'm revising the white paper is going to be around 40 pages, and then we'll have uh, resource kits. So we'll put in a resource kit, sample tips, sample campaigns, sample other things, and that'll be just kind of a, a resource kit you download um, in terms of the questions for that. Uh, why, is SharePoint on, uh, why is SharePoint adoption uh, less, don't you think, on-prem and Airpo SharePoint Online is not clear? Um, yeah, I, I guess, uh, Santosh, uh, it sounds like you're asking, um, it's, it sounds like the question is, when we look at on-prem versus online, you know, is is adoption less online? Is it greater online? You know, that's a common question I get, so I'm going to reframe it. Um, I will tell you that adoption online tends to be much higher, and the na number one reason for this is no more VPN. It's, uh, it's because it's accessible anywhere you are, and because of that, you actually tend to see greater adoption, not just of SharePoint, but other workloads online, even though they've had them on-prem and they might have had access, um, it just becomes a little bit more accessible. Um, the other reason that we tend to see online adoption increase is because it's integrated, so there's a little bit more exploration, um, and it's also uh, that there's mobile experiences, apps, and other things like that. So, um, you know, if you have a legacy technology like SharePoint 2010, and you have something like online, drag and drop, there's a whole lot of features um, that have have improved the experience which tends to have an impact on adoption for those who would use it they use it more as an example um, that's not 100 percent true there's a few specific examples with customers where they've had greater adoption on-prem but that's because typically it's uh, a very confusing launch of office 365 and uh, and it's because the activity is still happening on-prem so you have to determine where for which workloads do you want the activity to be on-prem or online and then just be really consistent about that so if you're saying community management and communities are all going to be in yammer and that's where we're going then move everything up there when it comes to broad large communities etc and just be really consistent with your messaging internally for that um, so that that's where i only ever see where on-prem tends to outspike it it's because of either it's just where the content and material and uh, discussion has been going on and it hasn't moved to the cloud or um, and, and there might be uh, compliance reasons for that, or they haven't moved it because um, they've created something else, but it's in pilot, or they've had an extended pilot, et cetera. You just want to move quicker um, in enabling some of these online environments. Um, all right, uh, that's all the questions I saw in the uh, questions that were submitted. Um, I think I think that's the core of what we wanted to talk about today.